Welcome everyone. I'm Nancy Bronstein. I am a Husqvarna Viking educator and today we're going to be talking about different ideas for embellishing your quilts. So before we get started though, I'll let you know that um, uh, my background is I've been sewing all my life and I absolutely love sewing and quilting and I do like a little bit of bling, uh, not a lot. And uh, I'm gonna try to have today's class be of interest to all types of quilters and, because there's a lot of different ways that you can embellish your quilts. Now, I have a feeling that today's class will probably be of greater interest to people who are making art quilts or um, modern quilts rather than your traditional quilter, you know, very precision, traditional style quilter, but you never know. Hopefully I'll, I'll say something that will spark some, um, uh, something for you to help with your projects. What I'm planning on doing today is to um, show you a whole lot of inspiration, different ideas for things that I have used to embellish quilts, and also show you little demos of how I did it. I am gonna show you pictures of projects. I have the projects right here. However, I, I wanted to do the pictures because then I can zoom into the detail and you should be able to see it better on your screen than if I hold it up and say, see what I mean? So we'll see how that goes. You let me know if you how you feel about that approach rather than just holding up the sample. So um, quilts can be embellished in, in various stages and in various ways. You can think about embellishment as um, from the very start when you first start to make your quilt or design it and that it could be a, a surface technique where you are doing something to the surface of the fabric before you even uh, cut into it so that you're changing the texture or the appearance of the quilt before you start to even piece. Or you could uh, start to do some embellishment as you piece or after you piece or the embellishment could be part of the quilting process or it could be um, adding decorative elements or stitches to your sashing. There's all sorts of opportunities to add um, your own little twist on your, on your projects. As we go along, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of different techniques and feet and different things. And if I don't show you how to do a certain technique, um, please, and you want to see how to do it, you don't know how to do it, please uh, put something in the comment. And uh, if I can, I will stop and, and demo that. For the most part, I think I will be demoing most things, but some things that, that I've done before in other uh, Facebook Lives, I may skip over. So um, the, as I said, there's different types of embellishments. Um, it could be decorative stitches. It could be embroidery could be adding things like satin cording or beads or a ribbon or paints or colored pencils. So we're gonna run the gamut today and I hope you'll enjoy it. So I'm gonna switch to my pictures and start talking about different techniques. So this is a table runner that um, illustrates using um, your decorative stitches. So I'm going to enlarge parts of it. So you can see these are the laser pictogram stitches that are, are in the um, Epic 2. Then the central area, it was in embroidery. However, it's just, for the, except for the, the design right in the middle, it is some of your decorative stitches that I took into design shaping and made that, created that, designed that embroidery to stitch out in, in, in uh, embroidery. So it's sewing stitches that were done in embroidery. <clears throat> then here's some of the some of my favorite stitches in the Epic and the Epic 2, which these are raw edge applique stitches. Maybe I can make it even a little bit bigger. Um, if any of you have the Epic or the Epic 2 and you've never done them, I'd be glad to show you how to do them. They are really cute and they can cover a lot of territory and add a lot of interest to your to your project. <clears throat> and let's see. So then this next, this next uh, sample here is a wall hanging. And what I wanted to show you with this one, first of all, I'll say that the dream, uh, the letters at the bottom were created right on the Epic. We have uh, design applique and you can make your own uh, banners with applique. 
um, right on the Epic or Epic 2, and also the Ruby 90, and uh, oh, many of our the wireless capable machines on the upper end of the uh, line. But what I wanted to show you for embellishment on this one is that while the, the uh, butterfly is done in embroidery, I took the project out and did the echo quilting and you have this real textural feeling because it was done with a um, twin needle. So you can actually do echo quilting with the echo quilting foot with a twin needle and get that textural effect that um, I think um, I kind of like, I hope you do. So I was gonna show you how I would go about doing that quickly. And uh, for those of you who may have never used the echo quilting foot, it's one of my favorite quilting feet. So I'm gonna switch over to the needle. So this is the echo quilting foot. It's a kind of a round disc with some lines on it. And uh, if this were an applique that we wanted to echo, first of all, on the package for the echo quilting foot, it says to drop your feed dogs. Now, um, for a project that's small, like a table runner or a poster, I mean, a, a, a wall hanging, or even a baby quilt, placemat, something like that, I would not drop the uh, feed dogs uh, because if you drop the feed dogs, then you have to pay attention to stitch regulation. Like you have to make, it just takes a little bit more concentration to get all your stitches even with the feed dogs dropped. And while you're trying to echo maybe a, an area that's complex in shape. So I keep the feed dogs up, don't have to think about stitch regulation. But if it's a big quilt, then you have to drop, drop the feed dogs because you can't um, maneuver the quilt as smoothly. With, it, just, it doesn't work because you can't, with that bulk, you have to have a smaller project that you can move more readily. So to have the feed dogs drop. So I'm gonna show you how I do this. I need a pointer here. So you, on the uh, echo quilting foot, we have an inner ring and an outer ring. And I will place the inner ring right on the stitch that I want to echo. So I'm going to put that right on there. Put my foot, my, um, well, I got to choose a sewing stitch first or we are not going anywhere. So I'm just choosing a straight stitch with my feed dogs up. Put my echo quilting foot down. And then I'm going to make sure that this inner ring stays on this blue stitch line at least for a little while. And I'm watching, watching that left side of the inner ring. And then I, as I start to um, come close to an area where the shape changes, I'm going to start watching the front part of that inner ring because when that hits this pedal, then I know I've got to make a hard pivot. Okay, now I'm going to go like this, and then I'm going to keep watching the left side of that inner ring. So that's just the basics of using the echo quilting foot, and I'll show you again. And then I'm going to put on the twin needle. So now I've watched, and now the uh, inner ring on the front part of the foot has touched that next pedal, so I know I've got to make a hard pivot. Now that a action is what allows me to echo something and it keeps the it, it will keep the overall shape of the object that you're echoing instead of as you go out ring after ring it becomes like this amorphous blob so it um, really is helpful love this foot so i'm going to stop here and uh, put on the um, twin needle so twin needles come in um, different sizes and one of the designations on the package will be the distance between the two you're not going to be able to see this probably maybe over here is the distance between the two needles so this is a two millimeter and i need to go into the settings on my epic two to set it for um, so it knows that this is a twin needle that has a gap of two millimeters so what i'm going to do is change my camera view again 
And I'm going to go into settings. And of course, I didn't check this earlier, so I might have to tool around here to find it. <clears throat> so we're in the settings here. So it's not, it's probably in sewing settings, not machine settings. So let's look at our sewing settings. And here we are down here. So I went to temporary sewing settings. First of all, I went to settings by touching the gear. I'm in temporary sewing settings. And right now my twin needle setting is off. I'm going to turn it on by touching the 2.0. So now the machine is set for my particular um, needle. And the stitch I'm going to choose, let's see, where was it? I'm going to choose this kind of wavy stitch. But I want it to be a little bit smaller than that. So I'm going to make it a little narrower and not quite so long, a little curlier. So let's see how that works out. So now I, I'm going to quickly change my needle here. And if you have any questions, please type them in. Do, you, do all of you have, while I'm, I'll just do a little bit of talking while I'm putting this needle in, do all of you have children or grandchildren that go trick-or-treating? This time of year always reminds me of uh, when my kids were small and they used to, uh, well, first of all, I used to make their costumes when they were really little and then they started getting involved, getting involved in it. So now I've got this twin needle. I'm gonna need two, um, two threads, obviously. When you thread your machine with a um, twin needle, you will, um, on the, the second spool of thread, you'll put um, that thread on the opposite th side of the tension disc. See if I can get this up here to show you. So you have your tension discs here. So one uh, thread would go on one side, the other thread will go on the other side. Now we'll get this back down here. So now I need to maybe refocus a little bit and thread my needle. So I remember one time when my son was, I don't know, about 10, he decided his costume was going to be that he was duct tape boy. This is something he came up with. And uh, he proceeded to make a costume out of duct tape. He looked kind of like a duct tape mummy to me. And he went out trick-or-treating with his friend and their family. And then I got a call a little later that there was a problem with the costume and that he had not designed something that would accommodate going to the bathroom. <laughs> so they had to get the scissors out. And that was that with that costume. <clears throat> but it was a memorable costume for sure. Okay, so now, sorry that this is taking a while. Those scissors were dull and it's not going to want to thread. So you can't use your automatic needle threader when you have a, the twin needle set up, unfortunately, and I am very spoiled having the automatic needle threader. Okay, so first of all, I'll show you what the stitch will look like and then we'll echo quilt. all this thread out of the way here. Now, if you were indeed quilting this, you would want to bring, you know, your bobbin thread up, but we're uh, going to skip over that step. So it makes a nice um, kind of textural effect because it is a little bit raised between the um, um, two different threads. So then we'll go back over here and it's basically the same idea where you're trying to keep it, the inner ring going along the um, the last row of stitching. You know, it's going to be a little bit different in this, that that stitch kind of goes in and out. It's kind of wavy. Now, 
And let's see if I can hold it up and you can see it better. So it makes a nice effect. Um, if I had done just a straight stitch, I could have done that too and just keep, keep on echoing. So it's a different type of, of look from your typical echo quilting and, um, you know, a nice change of pace. <clears throat> okay, so let's see, we have a, a question here. Let me get this thread cut here and start re-threading. Uh, question is, what is the name of that foot? That is the echo quilting foot. And I, when I take it off, I'll hold it up so you can see what it looks like. And then the other question is, can you do this process with any other foot? Um, are you talking about doing echo quilting or are you talking about doing um, sewing with a twin needle? Because certainly the twin needle can be used with many feet and you can in fact use it in embroidery. There are embroidery designs that are specifically made for the twin needle and they're very pretty when you use two different colors of embroidery thread. So if that's not what you mean, please uh, ask me in a slightly different way so I know what you're asking. So here's our typical wonderful um, automatic needle threader. Since I don't have a twin needle, I can use it. Okay, so that, let's see what's happening here. Hmm. Oh, it thinks it's saying I cannot use the automatic needle threader because it thinks I still have the twin needle on. So I have to go back into settings. I was wondering what was happening there. Go back into settings, go to my temporary sewing settings and turn that off and it will allow me to use the automatic needle threader. This does not look like it's quite in focus to me. That's better. Okay, so I'm going to take this foot off and I will hold it up so you can see what it looks like. I think, you know, if you do use, ever do echo quilting and you're doing it not in embroidery, you're doing it just on your machine, your sewing machine, you would really appreciate this foot. This is the, oops, go over here. This is what it looks like. It's one of those oddball feet that you have to take the ankle off for because it's been around for forever and it fits on many, many machines. If you have a, um, a, a different, you know, an older machine or a lower in the line machine, it probably will fit. And um, perhaps uh, our social media people, Meredith or Amy, could put a link to our accessory guide, which uh, is on our website. And the accessory guide will tell you, I believe it's page five, whether your foot will fit or that foot will fit your machine. <clears throat> so I got to put the ankle back on. And then moving back to our uh, samples here. So um, let's see. Now this is a quilt that um, I thought I should go a fairly traditional route with because of the fabric, um, the style of fabric it was. And also I wanted to use our uh, heirloom stitches to um, quilt this with. So these stitches are all in the heirloom menus and that it was quilted instead in with the feed dogs up using the uh, heirloom menu. And it's something like if you are a person who um, isn't comfortable doing ruler work, isn't comfortable doing free motion, this is a nice uh, alternative, particularly if you have this sort of um, uh, type of fabric. And I, Meredith, maybe you can tell me the, the style again. It's, um, it's, it's not vintage and it's not, it's, can't remember. Anyway, you know what I mean, looking at the fabric. So this is an alternative. And if you are going to do that style of quilting or even matchbook or um, straight line quilting with a, as a modern quilter, this foot is really helpful as you can imagine. You know, you put the foot on 
and you can go do rows of decorative stitches using these lines to guide you so that they are equal distance. These lines are all a quarter inch apart. So you get one row of stitches and you just make sure that your uh, red line stays on that row and you will have line after line of parallel stitches. Primitive, yes, Meredith says it's primitive style. The same thing happened in one of our other Facebook Lives recently, so I knew she knew the answer. <laughs> and um, she did, did add the accessory guide link in the chat. So let's see, we also have a question, echo quilting with any other foot. Um, I mean, you can echo quilt with any of your free motion uh, feet. However, um, this is really my favorite. Um, this foot I could I would do use for straight line when I want parallel lines of either decorative stitches or matchstick or or piano keys. And this I would use whenever I'm echoing something curved. So those are my two go-to in that instance. Um, of course, if you have the Epic 2, I would for sure put my laser on so that that would also add me add um, some assistance in doing straight line quilting because I can move that laser light to the left or to the right and keep things lined up really straight as well. <clears throat> but um, the Epic 2 is the only one in our line currently that has that. <clears throat> so going back to my photos here. Now this is a applique, sort of an abstract applique, uh, needle turn applique that I did. And, and what I wanted to show you here is that I um, added some interest in the corners and around the, um, sort of as a border around it with 12 weight thread. So 12 weight thread, particularly if you do a uh, triple stitch, which is what the inner, um, 12 weight thread you see that's closest to the grape leaves. That's a triple stitch. The other is just a, what is that called? Um, I can't remember. It's one of our decorative stitches, but it really, um, I think, adds something. Let's see if I can get it to go to unzoom. So I think it adds something to the whole presentation by having, oh, and I also have some variegated 12 weight. No, that's piping. Piping is also something that you could think of as an embellishment with a quilt. I think adding piping to the um, binding really adds a lot to quilts. And you get that pop of color and uh, it's, I, I do it on most of my quilts at some point. It's somewhere in the quilt there's some bi uh, piping. Then this uh, particular quilt has um, a few things decorative in it. It first of all, it's done with the um, circular attachment in sewing. So if you have just a sewing machine, you don't have an embroidery machine, you can get embroidery-like effects. Let's see if I can make this bigger. There we go. So all these circular um, lines of decorative stitches and the circular applique and reverse applique was done with the circular attachment. And I have done classes on that on Facebook. So there's, uh, if you go to our YouTube page, I'm sure there are uh, prior Facebook Lives on the circular attachment. But what I was gonna point out for this particular quilt is not only the stuff done with the um, circular attachment, but the decorative stitches, see if I can get my Apple pencil to work here. Maybe, maybe not. Well, I'm not going to mess with it right now. I think it ran out of charge. So there's decorative stitches that are framing this table runner, um, the yellow, red, and gold. Now that is um, uh, using DMC embroidery floss, the whole, all the strands of floss, it's not separated, using the um, three-hole yarn foot that I'm gonna show you in a minute. And I'm gonna to try to zoom in a little bit more. So you can see that um, you get this nice um, border uh, and it um, kind of gives a decorative element to the border rather than it just be the, the um, straight line quilting. And what I wanna point out is that 
you can see some gaps between the three strands of DMC. And I'll explain another option you have where you can use up all your old embroidery floss for this type of technique where you won't see the gaps. So <clears throat> we have two feet that you can do decorative stitches with. And I'm digging them out because I'm going to probably be talking about a variety of feet today. Okay, so this is the three-hole yarn foot. It has three holes. And then we have a five, seven hole foot, something like that. I'm, I'm not probably saying the exact right name, but it does have um, seven holes. And if you look at these two feet, you might think, well, why would I need both of those feet? Well, I'll tell you why. This foot, when you look at it, you can see that the holes are larger and they're further apart. So this is better for when you're going to sew down yarn for a decorative effect or satin cording. I think this is better for embroidery floss because as you can see, the holes are much smaller and closer together. So you will not see the fabric between the strands of embroidery floss. So if you have tons of embroidery floss like I do, because I used to be a hand embroiderer many years ago, and I just um, have, I don't know, a few boxes of that stuff. And I do mainly machine embroidery now. So now I use this foot, I use it with this foot. And I'll show you what it looks like when you stitch this stuff out. Okay, so there's a question, 12 weight work and regular bobbin and what needle? So when I use 12 weight thread, I put 12 weight on top and a regular sewing weight in the bobbin. If you want to use, you can do, you can do a technique called um, bobbin work where you are going to put really thick, maybe 12 weight thread in the bobbin um, or maybe even a little bit thicker, like an eight weight. And it's a special technique, and you're actually going to sew with your project upside down because the bobbin, the thread that's in the bobbin is the decorative element for the project. I tend to use 12 weight on the top with a 100 needle and um, probably a top stitch 100. It's got a bigger hole. And that's how I do the 12 weight on top, but I will use a regular sewing weight in the bobbin. If you put it in top and bottom, you're gonna have a knotty mess. At least that, that's been my experience. <clears throat> so I was just talking about the differences of things you can do with this foot. So this is the um, three hole yarn foot with gold um, satin cording with black thread. I think that's just such a nice, see if you can, I can get the light shining just right. You can see how pretty that is. Then down here is the other foot with seven strands of different color of DMC. So as I said, because the, the holes are so small and close together, then you don't you see the gaps in between um, if I were to thread the DMC, this embroidery floss in the three hole yarn foot, you would see some gaps in between. So it's nice to have both, depending upon the effect that you're going for. So um, you can also use the three hole yarn foot with just putting cording, like, like some satin cording in that first hole with a zigzag stitch and stitch down um, that satin cording. And I'll show you when I, a project that I used that on recently. Well, this is going wacky. Let's see, where is it? Down here. So this is a, a wall hanging I made from a panel of Klimt's painting, I think it's called The Lovers, but I'm not sure. At any rate, it's a very beautiful painting. And what I did with the satin cording is I, let's see if I can get it big enough where you can see it. Not behaving, there we go. 
So instead of stitching in the ditch to frame this uh, panel, I stitched down the satin cording with a zigzag stitch and gold thread over the top. And I think it gave it a really nice um, effect. And um, I also, I've got, you can't really see it too well in this photograph, but there are um, little embroideries done to quilt this. And I sewed a bead into the center of each embroidery because they're kind of um, star-like. So there's a little bead in the center because this, uh, I think this painting and this fabric is kind of luminous. And um, I like the gold cor cording and the beads in there. So um, does anybody want, to see me demo the three hole or the three hole yarn foot. I can demo it with the cording or you're pretty good on that. Good to go. Because I have demoed it in the past on Facebook. Okay, we're gonna move ahead. If you are wondering how, how that works, I will be glad to demo that. <clears throat> now let's see if I can get this back to my next Thing I want to talk about. Ah, okay. So sometimes with quilting, when you're doing a, even with a, um, oh, there are yeses coming in. Okay. So I will table this thought and go back and demo the three hole yarn foot. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to demo using uh, the satin cording. The three hole yarn foot does come with a threader which um, if you were using yarn, you would probably want to pull out the threader. With the satin cording, it is smooth enough that it doesn't get hung up poking it through the holes. First thing I usually do is I tie a knot because I find that if I don't, I'll get two in, I go to the third and they all fall out. Um, I would also recommend threading it before you put it on the foot, much easier. And I would, the way I thread it, is I thread it from the bottom and then pull all of them forward. <clears throat> see if I can keep this in the camera. As you can see, the satin cording just goes right in those holes. It would not go in the other foot's holes because they'd be way too small. <clears throat> okay, so I've got the three in there. And I just um, pull them through so that the knot is at the back. Then when I put the foot on the ankle, I wanna make sure that the knot gets pulled away a little bit so I don't start sewing on the knot. So I'm gonna stick that on my ankle. And use my automatic needle threader. Now, on many of our uh, Viking machines, there is a category called specialty stitches. And there are some, many of the machines will have these stitches where it looks like there's yarn behind the stitches. Those are designed for the three hole yarn foot. You can use other stitches as long as they are wide enough and they're not too thick. I wouldn't use satin stitches. It would just, I think, get knotted up. And if you ever wonder what a stitch is for, you can touch the question mark and then touch the stitch and it will tell you what it's for. And then when you load it, what you'll see on the screen is a question mark. And what the question mark means is that it is recommended an, recommending an optional foot. And then down here, it will tell you what that foot is. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go back to my other view. And I'm gonna make sure my knot is out from, the behind, out from behind my foot. So I'm not sewing on that because that would everything would get hung up then. Put my needle down. And 
what's really nice about this is it basically sews itself from this point. Um, but the um, foot keeps the satin cording from misbehaving and everything is good. Now, previously, I sewed down the sample with black thread. Now I'm using gold thread just to give you, you know, another view. So there's with, um, whoops, let's see if I can get it better over here. So there it is with matching thread. I think it actually looks better with contrasting, but, you know, it depends on your project and what you're, you're going for. But it definitely uh, provides, um, you know, a real area of interest. And let's see if we have some more questions here. Do you use stabilizer when doing decorative stitching? Yes. So on your screen, on many of our screens, and definitely on the Epic 2, up here, there's a little icon that looks like two pieces of paper. That means they're recommending stabilizer. And if you don't have a machine that has that sort of um, icon to clue you in, if you're doing a decorative stitch, I would use stabilizer. I've, I've mentioned this on Facebook before, I'm sure, and I have with my classes. It's a sort of sad story of how I learned how to do decorative stitches. Uh, when I got my first big girl machine many, many years ago, I, I was hesitant to use the decorative stitches because sometimes they would work out and sometimes they'd ruin my project because they'd be all knotty and ugly. And um, I realized, somebody clued me in or I don't know how it came to me, I realized that you, you're supposed to be using stabilizer, silly. Once I started using stabilizer, all those stitches look beautiful. So uh, when in doubt, just stick it under there. And um, the type would be dependent upon the project, you know, whether, um, you know, if it were something like, um, something you're going to turn over and you're going to see the backside, you'd probably want to use a water soluble. Um, something that's going to be on your skin, you're going to want something softer than tear away. So it depends on the project. Now, let's see another question. Could you use the circular attachment with the three whole foot? Probably. I don't think that I have done that. You'd have to go slowly. I have used the beating foot. I've used the open toe foot. I've used the, what else, cording foot. So you probably could, and you would have to try it out on a scrap piece of fabric. I have not, but it seems like, I wouldn't try a really tight circle, but the bigger circles I think would work. Um, let's see, on the Epic 2, where do you raise and lower the feet? Okay, so on the Epic, it's right, I'm assuming you meet on the head of the machine. There is a symbol here that has a foot with an arrow up and a foot with an arrow down. So that's where you up and down. So um, you may be asking this question because you had an Epic and then it's slightly different than the Epic 2. They did change the button configuration on the head of the machine between the Epic and the Epic 2. That was in response to consumer surveys from uh, customers you know, asking them, well, what do you like about uh, the machine? What do you not like so much? What, would, what do you think would be a better idea? And uh, people um, thought, for instance, that the reverse and the start-stop were too close together. They were hitting one when they meant the other, and that's not good. So that's why they move the buttons around. Um, if using the stitch on a quilt, will the batting suffice as stabilizer? Yes. You, if you're quilting with um, any, with it, whenever you're quilting, you don't need stabilizer because you've got the, you've got that quilt sandwich, you've got the batting, and that's acting as the stabilizer. I would say when you're using decorative stitches in quilting, you should have a um, sample quilt sandwich, like a little quilt sandwich made of the same fabrics and padding on the side, to try out your stitch before you do it on your quilt, because some stitches will. Um, they're just too stitch intensive and they don't work well with quilt sandwiches. So, or you'll learn that, oh, I, this will work, but I have to go real slow, that kind of thing. So have that quilt sandwich by the side of your machine and try out any new stitch before you do it on the real thing. 
Okay, so let's see. I'm going to go back to my presentation here. So here I was going to talk to you about using um, the software for using embroidery to quilt. Now, this quilt, I'm going to blow it up a little bit here, hopefully. So I knew that I had these reoccurring blocks that were three by three. So I went into the embroidery design software, the MySonet in the Spiral Wizard, and created a spiral that would fit a three by three block and then just repeated it. So this is uh, one way to use the Spiral Wizard to design um, something to quilt your quilt. And here's one where I made blocks with different spirals. Now, I'm bringing this up to show you, just to kind of give you some ideas. I'm not going to show you how to do that because I'm doing a My Sonat Facebook Live on November 9th on the Spiral Wizard. It's really fun, that wizard. So if you have the My Sonat software, embroidery software, or if you're thinking about purchasing it, come November 9th and you'll see how to make these things with the Spiral Wizard. So I'll just blow this up so you can see kind of what I did here. Here's many spirals. And then just, it's kind of like um, Spirograph when we were kids. Very similar to that. Now, another thing with embroidery that is fun to do is to use the uh, ribbon embroidery attachment. So you can add these cute embroidery designs that add a lot of texture. So like this design is really great for baby quilts things like that. And that is a separate attachment. The creative ribbon attachment allows you to do these ribbon embroideries. And you can even do them um, applique with the ribbon embroidery designs. Now I'm going to show you, we're going to get into using colored pencils, or you could use fabric paints. This quilt, uh, the, the um, central black panels are that were embroidered in the, grand, um, the turnable hoop, uh, the 360 by 350 hoop, our largest hoop, blanking on the actual name of it. And um, what I did with this um, quilt is I quilted it with white cotton thread and then used Derwent ink tense pencils to color it in. And I colored it in on both sides. So the back side looks the same as the front side. And uh, it was a fun project. Because it is black fabric in the background, you just kind of scribble over the, the, the thread, white thread and you don't see the scribbling. You just see the thread become the color you want it to be. And then I added some crystals. So that's kind of an interesting technique to add color to something. You know, if you wanted something to be, if you have something on a black background and it's not colorful enough for you, maybe the ink tense pencils would be something that would work for you. <clears throat> then speaking of those, this is another quilt that I colored. That quilt, is the whole cloth quilt done in embroidery. Um, it is in the MySonet library. It's the uh, quilt that's on the cover of the largest metal hoop. And if this were done in black with white thread, it would look like this. But what I did is I did it on gray fabric and I didn't like the way it looked. So then I used fabric markers to color it in. And that was a lot of fun. It's kind of like coloring with my kids. I was just trying to stay within the lines of my stitching. And then added prairie points. And now I'm going to talk more about using the uh, ink tense pencils. Let's see more questions. Um, how do the ribbon embroidery designs hold up when laundered? 
Um, I have not laundered them like a zillion times, but I have laundered them many times because I take them in my suitcase and they get handled and I wash them and they have so far handled up fine, handled fine. Um, will they last two generations? You know, I'm using cheap ribbon. I kind of doubt it, but they are holding up really well. So far, so good. Uh, when doing decorative stitching, another question, on a quilted project, do you set the machine to woven heavy? Yes. Thank you for asking that. That's a very good point. One of the benefits of having a Husqvarna Viking is we have the Joy OS advisor, where when you go to sew, the first thing you should do is set your fabric type. And I'll show you what I mean. So on the Epic 2, this is the home screen when you first open it up. If you're in sewing, you have all your fabrics here. And when you cho choose your fabric type, what will happen in the background is it sets everything up optimally for that fabric type. It'll give you the right stitch length and the right tension for the fabric type you have and for the stitch you're doing. So for a quilt sandwich, you want to use woven heavy. Good question. Um, and, okay, so the next thing I was going to talk about is the... Um, colored pencils. Let's see how much time we, we've got 15 minutes. Good. So Derwent Inktense pencils, they look like a regular colored pencil, but they're actually ink in the ink in here in a solid form. So what I like about them is that um, you can color with them like a regular pencil and um, you get a nice watercolor effect. You color, then you will paint over it with either fabric medium or aloe, and that gives it the watercolor-like effect. So I'm going to show you a sample. Actually, I'll show you a picture first. So this is some white fabric. This is some white fabric that I did some decorative stitching on. The one on the left has the same stitches as the one on the right, but on the one on the left, I used white fabric, white um, thread. The one on the right, I used black thread. And I wanted the stitching to kind of give it some texture. And then I used the uh, Inktense pencils to color it in and get like a rainbow watercolor-like effect. Now, this is probably not something that you are going to do for a whole quilt, <laughs> take forever. But if you have little parts of a project that, um, you don't have the right, you know, like you need a small amount of fabric that uh, you don't have the right color for. You, you can blend the, the colored pencils and just get a special effect. So I took those pieces and made this block and um, bring it a little bit closer. Of course, I was in a hurry and I measured wrong and cut my corners off. So quilt police do not judge me. This is a rush job. But it has, in person, it has a nice texture to it. And I like that uh, watercolory um effect now another idea if i get my stuff out here is that you can take uh, take fabric different fabrics and i um to do applique i usually will use some sort of adhesive on the back and i've got this beautiful like 60s style fabric and I had the adhesive on the back and I, um, you know, like uh, we have Fusion Stick, Fusion Stick 2, and there's other brands that have the same thing. And I have it on the back and then I cut out the flowers. And then I iron them on this fabric. And what I'm going to do is I am going, I've got a quilt sandwich. I'm going to do some free motion quilting and um, do some bad just add some embellishments and you'll see what I, where i'm going with it and then i'm going to finish it off with some ink tense pencils so the first thing i need to do is to switch my foot i'm going to uh, use the uh, r foot and i am going to do this free motion <clears throat> and i'm going to change my thread to black because i like how the end result is and also so you can see my stitches
And I'm going to go in and go into sewing. And let's go back. And I'll go into sewing. And I'm going to change this to free motion. So I'm going to go down to this icon down at the bottom that looks like a, a squiggle. And I'm going to choose the foot that I'm using, which is the free motion footing or the R, free motion floating foot or the R foot. And now this will have an impact on how tightly the foot is down on your fabric. I'm going to change it to negative. I'm going to change it to negative one, and then check if I like it there. I think that's where I liked it, and I'll explain that in a minute. And touch the check mark, and I will put the the foot up, and then put my foot down. And I want to see that. See, that's too. That's, well, let's see when I put my, actually put my needle in. Yeah, that's going to be okay. I can see that I can move my fabric around, but there's not a big gap there. So let's bring the needle back up. So <clears throat> you want it so that you can move your fabric and that the, the foot is not causing any drag on the fabric as you go to do your design. <clears throat> and if this were indeed a quilt, I would, you know, bring my bobbin thread up, but I'm not going to um, worry about that right now. <clears throat> so these are just glued on, you know, with the adhesive. So I am going to tack them down a little bit. And I will tell you right off the bat, this is not a technique probably for someone that is a traditional precision quilter. This is more like whimsical, um, uh, what, what's the other word, um, shabby chic kind of stuff. Um, it's a lot of fun, but it's not precise in any way, shape or form. <clears throat> so I've got my free motion on and I'm going to get a good grab, good hold on my fabric. Certainly having a larger surface, uh, like one of those extension tables and that um, type of um, topping that um, reduces friction would definitely help this, but we're going to forge ahead with what we've got. Um, disengage. Oh yeah, it doesn't want that down. I just had to put the IDF up, the integrated walking foot. So I'm just going to tack down my circle and probably cut this. Now, if I wanted to, I could have pre-drawn with a fabric marker a design, but I'm just going to throw caution to the wind and start sewing here. And it's getting hung up for some reason. Yeah, something's going on with the bobbin. Of course, when we're live, that's going to happen. Yeah, the bobbin thread is not being pulled up for some reason. Let's see what's happening down here. Oh, it's uh, knotted. Okay, so let's try another bobbin. <clears throat> that doesn't seem to be flowing too well. That feels better. These bobbins have been sitting in my drawer for quite some time. I don't know why it felt stiff, but it did. Okay. Take two. Because there was no bobbin thread, it was easy to remove. So again, I would bring my bob, well, maybe I should bring my bobbin thread up. And then I'm just going to make some petals.
Now I could go on to the applique and do some design there. So you just freeform make some flowers and I'll show you um, what the end result can look like. So this, let's see, is this, yeah. So this side, you see the black thread where there was an applique here, a flower, a circle, and then a circle here. And I, um, embellished it with the thread and um, then went back and colored in the petals and the leaves <clears throat> with the ink tense pencils. And the nice thing about this technique is that when you flip it over, you can do this, you can color in the back side and the back side can look just as nice as the front, just slightly different because you don't have the appliques in there. But you can do, um, let's see if I can hold, no can't quite get it just right maybe under here so you can see that's probably the best it's going to be so you can get these um you know nice flowers and um it's a lot of fun it's a fun technique so depending upon the project like i said this is a more of a whimsical technique um and uh is good for certain things you know that wouldn't wouldn't go with every quilt now when you get to the point where you are doing the ink tense pencils I'll show you how you do that. So we have our um, beginnings of a flower here. And it's pretty simple. You take your pencil and you're just going to color between the lines and you can keep it very light in color if you want. Or you can add a little bit more pressure and you'll get a deeper, more rich color. Or you can have it um, kind of two-tone, Go with, start with one color and then go into another. What do I got here? Deep indigo. Yeah, it looks like black. I don't like that color. Maybe a green. And that doesn't have a point on it. Um, Like I said, this is actually ink and the fabric medium will set it and it also gives it a, a nicer um, watercolor look. So I'm gonna put some fabric medium on there and show you the difference. And then I would also, once this is dry, um, take a hot iron to it to set it. And I have laundered these and have had no problem with it fading. Now I have laundered the fabric medium. I don't know about the aloe, but a lot of people do use aloe. <clears throat> so you can see how that would be a fun technique and um, you know combining uh, getting your hands dirty and painting and sewing so any final questions we're at the top of the hour <clears throat> nope looks like there's no questions so um i will be monitoring this um posting on Facebook for the next week. If you do have any questions, um, I will address them within the next week. And what is fabric medium? Okay, that's the question. So uh, fabric medium is 
basically something that um, helps to set the color and um, it's something that artists use with acrylic paints and it um, keeps it from bleeding when you wash the fabric. So it's, um, it just makes it more permanent and because otherwise if you don't put it on, it's going to smudge and it's really going to get faded. So it, 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 it um, creates a more long lasting product basically. Do you dip the pencil in the medium if you are coloring in a small space? That, that's a different technique. You can do like I did where you colored in, you put the fabric medium on top, or you can dip it in the fabric medium and then just paint with it. So it, it's similar uh, effect, slightly different, but um, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the medium fabric medium does make the color more intense. So um, you just play around with it before you do it on your actual project. So they're asking me to remind you that there are some Facebook Lives coming up on November 2nd, 2 p.m. with Wendy, Get Inspired with Design, Applique. And 2 p.m., I think that would be Central Time, right, Meredith? And uh, Your time, not my time. I would be 3 p.m. my time. So 2 p.m. Central Time. And as I said before, I'm doing a MySonet Live on the Spiral Wizard on November 9th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Central time um, on the MySonet page. So please join me that MySonet, the Spiral Wizard is also a lot of fun. So now I have a question, which medium do you use? I use the fabric medium and I, this is the brand Liquitex. They sell both the um, pencils and the Liquitex at your big box craft stores. You know, you can save money with a coupon. Um, the pencils last a long, long time. They are expensive, but they do last a long time. So, but, so they're worth the um, investment. And then if there's a color you use weight, you know, a lot more than others, like as you can see, I'm partial to turquoise and blue and green. Um, those are getting smaller, whereas my brown is, looks almost untouched. <laughs> so um, I hope you uh, learned, picked up something today, you know, learned something that you'll take out and use with your quilting and have fun with and um, happy sewing. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today.